In my previous video, I explained that sugar fasting works because it starves the bad gut bacteria, the sulfofibrio of dietary cysteine, which is the essential nutrient required for its growth and survival. The reason that the sugar diet is very low in cysteine and therefore starves the bad bacteria of cysteine is because the sugar diet is very, very low in protein. And cysteine is a sulfur-based amino acid, a sulfur-based protein. So a very low protein diet is also a diet which is very, very low in cysteine. And cysteine is a sulfur-based protein which this bad bacteria needs to grow and survive. The clue is in the name, desulfofibrio. They need this sulfur-based protein to survive. I explained that when this bad bacteria gets starved out of the gut, it corrects faulty GLP-1 production. So starving desulfofibrio bacteria of cysteine increases GLP-1 production by the gut, which improves leptin sensitivity. And this improved leptin sensitivity increases levels of FGF21 and FGF21 sensitivity. And an additional benefit of high carb or high sugar versions of low cysteine diet strategies compared to low carbohydrate versions like fat fasting or very low protein ketogenic diets appears to be that the addition of carbs and sugars increases FGF21 levels even more due to their ability to directly increase FGF21 levels. So these high carbohydrate versions of low cysteine diets truly maximize FGF21 levels to put the body in a truly optimal hormonal state to support fat loss and health in every way. So first of all, what is this FGF21 that everyone is talking about and why is it so beneficial for health and weight loss? A study published in the journal Cell Metabolism in 2014 found that mice on a low protein, high carb diet showed strong increases in FGF21 levels and that this correlated strongly with lower body fat, increased energy expenditure, improved insulin sensitivity, improved lip lipid profiles, lower fasting glucose, longer lifespan, lower cardiovascular risk markers, and mice allowed to eat freely still lost weight and lived longer if protein was restricted and carbohydrates were high. And they found that FGF21 was central to this effect. And in a very recent study, which was published in Nature Metabolism in 2025, a human study found that protein restriction caused an increase in FGF21 levels, which seemed directly tied to an increase in energy expenditure, increase in liver fat, an increase in mitochondrial efficiency, and an increase in improved insulin sensitivity. And to further show that it is FGF21 that is indeed having these benefits, a 2012 study published in Cell Metabolism showed that direct infusion of FGF21 into obese mice, increased energy expenditure, improved glucose homeostasis, reduced liver fat, improved lipid profiles, and this was without any increase in physical activity. It was a purely metabolic boost. Now let's have a look at how FGF21 levels get activated on low protein diets. The increase in FGF21 levels is a result of starving bad bacteria in the gut of its essential nutrition, sulfur-based proteins. Let's have a look at one study which supports this model. The researchers in this study stated, here we confirm previous reports that dietary protein restriction triggers the FGF21 pathway and further demonstrate that this response is mediated by the gut microbiome. In the absence of a gut microbiome, we discover that FGF21 is desensitized to the effects of protein restriction i.e. if there is no gut microbiome to alter, protein restriction does not increase FGF21. FGF21 happens because of what protein restriction does to the microbiome. They also state that FGF21 may in fact be responding first to changes in the gut microbiome.
So how is protein restriction affecting the gut microbiome and how is that increasing FGF21? I have described in detail in my other videos how the bad bacteria Desulfovibrio are responsible for obesity and poor health because they reduce GLP-1 secretion in the gut and this induces leptin resistance, FGF21 resistance and lower levels of FGF21. As an example, let's just look at one more video here that shows that the bad bacteria in the gut are responsible for reduced GLP-1 production in the gut. The researchers in this study found that desulfofibrio produced hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct of metabolizing sulfur-based amino acids like cysteine. And this hydrogen sulfide reduced the production of the GLP-1 hormone by the gut. This is just one mechanism by which desulfovibrio bacteria reduce GLP-1 secretion. As I've discussed in other videos, the bad bacteria also reduce GLP-1 secretion by the gut because they damage the bile and alter bile signaling in the gut. So this is two ways that desulfovibrio reduces GLP-1 secretion in the gut. But how does this affect FGF21 levels? It is because GLP-1 increases leptin sensitivity and improved leptin sensitivity increases FGF-21 levels and FGF-21 sensitivity. This was demonstrated in a study published in Cellular Physiology and Biochemistry in 2016, where researchers reported that leptin injections in adult rats significantly increased plasma FGF21 levels, and in vitro experiments showed that leptin directly elevated FGF21 gene expression. There has been some concern expressed that obese people may not benefit from the increase in FGF21 induced by a low protein diet because obese people are FGF21 resistant. However, because the low protein diet is correcting leptin sensitivity and this is the source of the increased FGF21 levels, at the same time leptin sensitivity also increases FGF21 sensitivity at the same time. Therefore, the protein restriction by starving out the bad bacteria increases leptin sensitivity. This increase in leptin sensitivity is responsible for not only an increase in FGF21 levels, it is also responsible for an increase in FGF21 sensitivity. So not only does it increase FGF21 levels, it also enables us to actually benefit from those increased FGF21 levels by improving FGF21 sensitivity. So protein restriction itself increases FGF21 levels and FGF21 sensitivity, but there may be an additional benefit to combining protein restriction with a high carb and even a high sugar diet. This may be where a high carb, low protein approach is even more effective than a low carbohydrate, low protein approach, such as fat fasting. It is because there is some evidence that glucose and fructose increase FGF21 as well. So by eating carbohydrates and sugars with our low protein approach, we may be truly optimizing our FGF21 levels not only getting an increase from the protein restriction, but also an increase from the carbohydrates and the sugars. Let's look at the evidence. In studies published in 2014 to 2016 in the journal Cell Metabolism and Nature Communications, mice on low protein, high carbohydrate diets had much higher FGF21 levels, better insulin sensitivity, lower blood glucose and longer lifespan. Low protein, high fat diets raised FGF21 as well, but the metabolic effects were weaker. The researchers found that carbohydrates seem to act synergistically with protein restriction to amplify FGF21 and energy expenditure. High carbohydrate versions of low protein diets produce larger FGF21 increases as well and therefore also greater improvements in insulin sensitivity and therefore greater improvements in metabolic parameters. High fat versions still increased FGF21, but less robustly than the high carbohydrate version of the low protein diet. 
So what is the mechanism by which glucose and fructose activate FGF21? Well, for FGF21 is induced when glucose and fructose activate carbohydrate response element binding protein. And which is more potent to increase FGF21, glucose or fructose? In many rodent studies, fructose produced higher FGF21 levels than glucose at equivalent doses. In humans, a similar trend has been observed, but milder. For example, a 2017 study published in Cell Metabolism showed that both glucose and fructose increase FGF21, but fructose generally produces a slightly larger and faster FGF21 peak. So that is just some of the science which evidences this model of how the sugar diet is having such great results for so many people to help them shift stubborn body fat. It starves the bad bacteria of their essential nutrition and this improves leptin sensitivity and thereby FGF21 sensitivity and FGF21 levels. And these FGF21 levels are optimally maximized by the high carb, high sugar element of the strategy. Could this be the most effective diet strategy ever? But what about dietary fat? We know we have to keep dietary protein very low. What about dietary fat? Why is it a good idea to keep dietary fat low at the same time? Watch this next video to read more about the science of why people get even better results by keeping dietary fat low as well. Thanks for listening and hopefully see you in the next one.